just been out walking around, came across the, the bones, the weathered bones of a few different species of animals. So what, you ask? Well, look, nature awareness is all about almost looking at the ecosystem as an entire living device, a system, literally, an ecosystem. So when I find the bones of an animal, whilst I might not have the honour or the privilege of seeing the animal live in its prime state of existence, in the, the full bloom of its life, I can still learn a lot about what species are existing in that particular ecosystem. So as a tracker, when I've, when I've worked with environmental scientists particularly, I learned quite a few years ago that they can take something like this femur from a small redneck wallaby and be that specific. We can identify species by measurements, by shape, and by the dimensions of this particular bone. I find that an incredible thing because that then allows me, as a, as a lay scientist, as a lay observer of the natural environment, to understand and to correlate other bits of information. I might find hair on a fence line where an animal's pushed under it. And around the, the water hole, I find various tracks. And I can use those by measurement, observation, and by comparison to figure out what species are using that water hole, what species is moving under that fence. And when, the, when the animal eventually passes on, I can use its bones to do something very similar. So specifics are available in various reference points. In Australia, we only have probably one, which is probably Barbara Triggs, Scats tracks and other signs of animals, where we've got the measurements of these bones particularly collected up. So it's bones, it's scat, it's feeding sign. All these things help us work out what species exist in our environment. So as a astute observer of the natural world, we become more capable of expecting what may be there, seeing what is there, and then working with the facts of what actually is found in that location. Here's one I found a couple of days ago walking around. This is an act, actually a feral goat. Okay, so it's the skull of a feral goat. And again, by understanding what that skull looks like, even though it's devoid of, of its flesh and tissues and fur and everything now, I can still clearly work out what kind of species is represented by this skull. Also, I get other information about the particular breed of this type of goat. This looks like a bit of a boar goat. We do have some crossbred boar goats that have gone wild in this area over the last few years. So it's probably one of those. But I look at other aspects of this. If I'm not sure, for example, look at the orbit space. So the orbit where the eyeballs would be. In this case, they're very, very much on the side. So by matching up that piece of information, I know that this animal had a peripheral vision focus. Not like my eyes, which are forward facing. To other species who didn't know what a human being was, I automatically press alarm bells because I've got forward facing eyes. That indicates to them that I'm a predator because I've got binocular vision. I'm good at running down things, ranging things, and all those kind of activities to procure food. This guy, by contrast, his eyeball is on the side of his head. So he's got a broad range of peripheral vision to detect predators as they approach or attempt to approach. So we know that this is a herbaceous animal, a herbivore. And if we, we can confirm that by looking at the teeth. Okay, so the teeth have got that grinding flat molar appearance to them. Right? Small incisors at the front that have been lost, which are where it takes browse off plants. And then the upper palate there tells us it's used, it's, it's probably likely to have a jawbone at the lower edge compatible with grinding and chewing a cud. Okay. So there's a lot of really interesting things we can learn from a bleached old skull like that. And just by comparison, this one I found just not long ago, this is the jawbone of the same redneck wallaby skeleton we talked about with the femur, its leg bone. So this is the left hand side of the animal's jaw. Okay, so we can see that long rodent-like incisor here, and again, the flat tooth of a grinding herbaceous animal. So this bone here would also provide me with all dimensions that I could compare with the, the relative literature to learn about this species. So with those 
three sets of, of bones that I've just collected in the short space of the last few hours, we know that there's a, we've got a fair bit of information about those two species of animals as they exist in this ecosystem, even if I never see the living animals. So don't just walk past bones. The next time you're out bushwalking, have a look. If you're worried about getting your hands dirty, stop poking them with the stick, move them around. See if you can work out what the species was. If you can't work out the species exactly, take some photographs, take note of things like the teeth, the orientation of the eyes, whether it's a horned animal or a, a, a pole animal, and just learn what you can learn. There's a lot of things out there to provide you with learning opportunities. There is no limit to the learning that you can obtain from the great and amazing school that is the natural world.